Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending our session. I think this will be the last session of Kubernetes conference in Europe, right? Yeah. So it's very, it's very glad uh, to come in person to this conference because we used to do this quite often, but after the pandemic, I think most of our sessions were mostly online. And it's really glad that to do this offline and the first, first time to do it in, 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 in Europe, right? In, in Kubernetes conference. Yeah. So it's very glad to do that here. So uh, maybe a little bit of introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Giovanni. I'm a senior engineering manager from GoTo Financial. And yeah. you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. yeah, my name is Iqbal Farabi. I'm an engineering manager in GoTo Financial as well. Yeah. So uh, I, this is probably the only non-swearing Spanish uh, word that I know. <laughs> so apologize. I, I don't understand any other sp Spanish word. <laughs> so OK. Uh, yeah, just a little bit of introduction. Uh, the company that we are working at right now is GoTo Financial, but maybe more person, like more people here, actually knows about our other uh, group, which is called Gojek. So I think recently, uh, last year, we merged with one of the biggest e-commerce player in Indonesia to form GoTo. So Gojek and Tokopedia merged become GoTo, and all the pa uh, payments and financial division are moving into its own group called GoTo Financial. So Right now, I'm representing GoTo Financial. So we have a lot of offerings right now in our ecosystem. Uh, but today, I will focus more on the payment solution, which is called GoPay in Indonesia. Just to give you some snapshots of what we've been doing right now in Indonesia and Southeast Asia in general, we have a payment and financial personal finance solution right now in, in GoPay. And we are serving offline and online ecosystem. So offline is like the payment using QR code and online is payment in e-commerce and also the, our ride hailing and uh, food delivery solution. Our offering mostly resides in Southeast Asia, but primary life right now in Indonesia, but we will expand soon uh, to other countries as well. Yeah. Uh, we have 300 plus engineers. Uh, we have uh, more or less 500 plus services, and there are around 30 plus Kubernetes cluster right now in multiple environments, uh, and we are utilizing multi-cloud. And we also have some uh, workload in on-premise on data center as well. Uh, actually, we've been sharing this, uh, our journey with the community in the past few years. There's been uh, talks that our team has been doing. We've been, for example, I think one of the very first tech that talk that we've been doing is that uh, we're sharing about our journey migrating to Kubernetes. And then we also uh, migrated to Istio, I think, a couple of years back. And we have also been building and migrating into our uh, own developer portal, developer platform. We call it the gopay.sh. Uh, still ongoing migration right now, but uh, my team told me that uh, we are going to complete this uh, as soon as this June. So it's already 90% complete migration to this developer platform that we have. Just as a, you know, a sneak peek, we've been uh, talking about this also in KubeCon LA. Uh, we have. Uh, we are, we are building this uh, on top of uh, open service broker API. So we want to make sure that people uh, in the organization can actually build add-ons that can be integrated with our developer portal. Uh, it's actually, uh, before this talk, I was actually attending another talk in KubeCon about composability. I think this is, the, this is the architecture that we pick so that we can have composability in mind and people can actually contribute into our own internal ecosystem, which, which has been a great journey so far for us, right? However, uh, today we are going to talk about case engineering. And I will actually invite Iqbal to the stage about the challenge that we are facing right now. Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you, Gyo. So now I'll talk about uh, our challenges. So uh, the first of all is uh, with regards to complexity. So uh, as a payment company, uh, the lifeblood of a payment company is use cases. So what we want is actually we want to ensure that you can pay with our app in any platform. You can play in Google Play. You can pay with GoPay in uh, iOS App Store. You can play in Netflix and etc. So many use cases. Uh, it means that uh, GoPay will always come with a lot of integrations with third parties. And this means that we have a lot of uh, microservices and components such as databases, uh, uh, a key value store cache uh, or Kafka and yeah, you name it like there are tons of services and components in uh, our system. Uh, it means also that more and more people are getting involved uh, in uh, 
developing and maintaining the system. Now, um, it means that the system that we have already complex as it is, and it's only getting more and more complex. Now, with this, uh, what we find out that actually we are at the point in which there is not a single person in our organization that actually uh, can fit in everything uh, that we have in our system in their head. Like, every one person only understand a part of the system and not a single per person can fit everything in their head. So, it also means that uh, interaction between all the subsystems that made the whole system uh, uh, is not really, you know, very easy to understand for even for people who have been there uh, for a very long time, right? So, this leads to a lot of uh, increasingly no novel incidents happening. What we mean by novel incidents are uh, incidents that we never faced before. So, that's one thing. The second thing is around uh, our challenges is around compliance. Uh, what do we mean by that? Uh, the first is around uh, as a tech company, we are uh, operating in a heavily regulated industry. It means that we need to comply with multiple uh, regulations from multiple government uh, institutions, right? So therefore, uh, there are several things that we need to be aware of. Uh, one of them being data sovereignty, but this won't be our topic for today. Uh, the second will be, uh, being about reliability. Even in government regulations, there are like certain amount of uh, reliability threshold that we cannot cross below that. Like if you cross below that, there are uh, consequences that uh, you are going to face with regards to your license to operate as a financial tech company, right? So now, uh, Therefore, reliability has been uh, a big uh, a big topic for us. I mean, this has been a main topic for us in our infrastructure engineering team. So, what we uh, when we started this, uh, we every team uh, every team has their own uh, kind of definition of what reliability means, right? I mean, because the, th the system is so big, every team define their own reliability matrix. There is no uh, agreed upon uh, reliability metrics uh, that is uh, applied to organization wide so it means uh, it is hard to prioritize reliability because uh, everyone is defining their uh, reliability in their own terms uh, second is make it even harder when incidents happening especially when these incidents are uh, involving uh, various uh, uh, involving parts in the system where various uh, different system interact with each other and then uh, with the grow the growing or the growth of the system uh, it is getting harder and harder to ensure who own which services and which components because uh, as a hyper growth company like uh, we keep adding more uh, we keep uh, hiring more people adding new teams even moving one team from uh, one org structure to another it is hard to keep track okay who owns what and lastly, of course, this leads to uh, getting harder to uh, keep track, like who is accountable for uh, which reliability metrics. Uh, but over the year, like uh, I think in the past one year or so, we are working on this. We managed to ensure that we now have a well-defined uh, SLI and SLO that is uh, uh, applied organization-wide in the sense that we know for sure what, when we talk about reliability in our uh, go pay white organization, what does that mean? This is important because uh, before we can go into the next phase of uh, chaos engineering in our organization, we need to be able to know which threshold we cannot cross as a company that uh, works in heavily regulated industry. Uh, now, SLI and SLO has been a common language uh, across the entire team, and it is, uh, of course, due to the hard work of uh, our team and uh, every other team that uh, you know working in uh, GoPay engineering team, and then uh, we also adopt uh, better uh, incidents handling mechanism. And with regard to GoPay SH rollout that uh, Gio talked earlier, we now have a clear uh, way to track which services and which components belong to which team, even if they're moved. And then, of course, it is getting easier for us to ensure who is accountable for which reliability metrics. And this is uh, an important factor later on when we talk about uh, chaos engineering. So, uh, however, however, despite all of that effort, some novel incidents keep happening. Uh, and we like kind of, at some point, at some point, 
there were a few very rough weeks uh, in which a lot of, uh, not a lot, but some big outages happen. And to the point that our stakeholders come to sit with us, like the leadership and, uh, you know, the sea level and above, right? They come to sit with us, uh, okay, what happened here, uh, right? Uh, and then we explain that th this is, these are novel incidents. We haven't had this before. And then uh, luckily for us, you might think, okay, why do you think like uh, incidents are luck? <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah, it's not lucky in that sense, but uh, luckily for us then actually our leadership and us, our stakeholders uh, and us, uh, engineers, we come to the same conclusion that at this point, uh, sorry, at this point, the complexity of our system has exceeded uh, uh, the uh, has exceeded any one single person's understanding, and therefore, like at the time we propose, how about let's do chaos engineering? Uh, let's try this. So yeah, it begins our journey to chaos engineering. Of course, uh, customary. Uh, I forget the name again. <laughs> Uh, little finger <laughs> uh, gift, yeah, my favorite character in Game of Thrones. Anyway, so uh, we try to learn about cost engineering, and we admit that I, we actually find that actually we know the terms, but we don't really know what it means. And then, whenever like at the first we thought, okay, let's just burn this place down, right? I mean, break everything in production. Let's go. And in fact, this is like whenever we talk about chaos engineering in our team, this like. Every, what every person thinks most of the time, right? But, uh, but come to think of it, like, can we really do that with all the regulations around our reliability? Can, can we really do that? Uh, we had a hard problem on that in the beginning. Uh, but then we did our research and we figured out that this is from the principles of care engineering website. Actually, it is more about discipline about uh, experimenting in order to build uh, confidence in our system cap capability in, uh, to sustain turbulence in production. So, so what does that mean? It means uh, this is also customary. Like if you go to any chaos engineering talk, probably you will see these principles, right? Uh, to build hypothesis around steady state and then very real events and then do experimentations in uh, production and then do it continuously, uh, auto automate and minimize blast radius. So. What we found out that chaos engineering is not only about introducing chaos, but uh, in especially in uh, organization that really, really uh, care about reliability, uh, reliability metrics, chaos engineering is about continuous verification. And this is from Casey Rosenthal himself uh, in, the, uh, in his book, uh, Chaos Engineering. So basically, it is a uh, continuous verification is about proactive experimentation in so software that uh, to verify uh, the behavior of our system. And uh, now, then we found out that uh, actually it's, it is uh, like this cycle. First, you build hypothesis. What we did is we built hypothesis about understanding about our, our understanding about our own system. Because previously, we didn't even kind of check, like we didn't even bother to check whether our understanding of our own system is correct. And after we did this uh, building hypothesis, then we uh, do experiment to basically check whether our understanding of our own system is correct. And then uh, it, we verify that, and whatever the result of the experimentation, uh, we feed back into the system, we document everything, We uh, write down uh, the uh, action items when we find something is not matched between our sending of the system with how the system actually behaves. And then this is uh, an important part that we find that make it institutional knowledge, right? I mean, uh, so ensure that whatever findings that we have, everyone in the organization knows and understands about it. So that's uh, our uh, like kind of uh, our start with uh, chaos engineering. Now, Gio will talk about what practices we have adopted so far. All right. Thank you very much, Iqbal, for uh, sharing the challenge that we are facing in, in the organization. I think, uh, sorry, am I audible? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think I'm audible now. So, I'm going to start talking about the practices that we've uh, been adopting and trying to adopt 
obviously not completely everything already, we already adopted. And we also been learning so much from this community so far. And we've always trying to improve our practice even further. So without further ado, uh, just a little bit of recap about what we've been implementing so far. Uh, we have, just to give you context about our current infrastructure that we have. We have migrated to Kubernetes, we have migrated to Istio, we have our developer portal, we have SLI and SLO organization wide, and we just recently revamped our incident management uh, practice, right? Now, now what's next? What, what to do if we want to do uh, chaos engineering, right? The first thing, like the first principle, if we want to, you know, if we want to actually break down completely the problem that we want to solve and the things that we want to achieve, in my mind right now, the most important thing is to actually build institutional knowledge and improve our system. This is the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is not actually about breaking stuff in production. That was never the actual goal. If you can actually achieve this without doing those breaking stuff in production, that, 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 that'll be great, right? So I think this is actually the, the, the first principle about uh, how we improve our system uh, reliability. So based on these principles, the first thing that we're doing is not actually doing anything on production. The first thing that we're doing is to centralize knowledge on our known current limits or capability. So this is the first thing that we're doing, right? What is the example of this activity? For example, we, we, we do a discovery again from our past postmortem. So luckily that we have revamped our incident management process, we have a collection of the RCAs and postmortem available on our uh, platform right now. So the team has been studying the past RCAs and postmortem again because there might be cases where the action items that is implemented was not actually uh, done completely, right? There, there are cases where some of the action items might be easy enough to implement, some of the others might not. It might require major changes. The problem with that, those kind of uh, items is that it might not be recorded in a, in a like organization scope uh, or manner, right? Because it might be only a tribal knowledge of some certain teams. So by doing this activity, by revisiting all of the uh, postmortems again, this time as an organization, we are, can actually at the same time building uh, our knowledge on our current limits, right? So this is the example of uh, how we actually built that. So after we get information from these past postmortems, uh, We've, we have this uh, simple, uh, like basically we categorize those items into three things, right? So for example, to the, to the right, right, we have a scenario which we identified, we need manual intervention to recover from such scenario. And then to the middle, there are scenario where we are not actually really sure about it, right? And to the left, there are scenario that we know for sure that it can actually recover on its own. So the problem is, if we want to do experiment now, which, which segment that we should target, right? Because like, if you know for sure that it's broken, if you know for sure that you need manual intervention, that it means that you, cannot, you don't actually have to do experimentation at all. You have to fix that, right? So the first, the first uh, to the right, right, you have to basically improve that situation. To the left, if you know that for sure that it's actually able, the system able to recover on its own, you need to verify ideally continuously. So this is actually next stage, right? Because you want to avoid regression later. This is the next stage. But in the middle, so this is actually, uh, when, when people talk about chaos engineering, actually this is the first thing that comes up with their mind. But like after our learning about chaos engineering, our conclusion was chaos engineering is so much more than that. Be because it's not just things in the middle, but it's also a plethora of other things as well, right? So after we identified these uh, items, the, the, and we keep adding them, right, as we learn about new things about our system right now, the objective is to move this to the left, right? As much of the item, it should be moved to the left, right? This is our uh, main objective, right? And you have to actually continuously doing this because, again, we are a complex system and it keeps getting more complex. It, we, we will keep adding more items and Obviously, we have to keep move everything to the left, right? So, yeah. Um, you maybe uh, read about advisory bulletins in the slide. I just want to give you what, what, what does it means. So, this is actually inspired from airworthiness directive in uh, airline industry. So, what, this, it, what it means is that uh, if you have an airplane, it cannot take off before it completes all of the airworthiness directive. So, same thing with our organization right now. 
again, not all the items can be fixed immediately, but what we, what, what we can do for those items is that we can release an advisory bulletins, and we can advise teams who wants to launch a new features, who wants to launch a new service. They need to actually make sure that all of the services are actually uh, comply with this advisory bulletin that we release, right? Uh, another thing, right? Another activity that we can do, we can also interview people and review their understanding of their of the system. Actually, when we did this exercise, this, the result actually surprised us because it turns out each people understanding about uh, the system are completely different from one another, right? Even for people who are directly working with the system, right? Those people actually have different understanding with one another. You, if you haven't actually tried this before, try that. Uh, the result might actually surprise you. Right. And again, right, uh, we, we want to keep adding more items to that, to, that, uh, to that list that I showed you before. Another thing that we can do is obviously the verification by experimentation. There are a couple of things that we can do uh, in doing this experimentation. I think the most safest way to do it is by doing game day. Uh, like uh, game day is a, like you can actually build a simulated environment and then you can actually ask people to test your system by running scenarios, right? This is the safest way, because typically when you're doing game day, you will have a simulated environment in uh, different places, not on your production, right? This is the safest way to start doing uh, this experimentation. Another safe way that we've been uh, feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, having pretty successful is that we can also experiment by piggybacking uh, operational activities, right? Like we are running a Kubernetes cluster right now. There are 30 Kubernetes cluster, more or less. Uh, and we, all, uh, we are doing continuous upgrade uh, every, every few months, right? And whenever we do the continuous upgrade, we are rather than upgrading, doing the upgrade in place, we are actually shifting the workload from, all, from the old node into the new node. It means that we will recreate all the workload. Even by piggybacking that activity, we discover some new information about our system. For example, implicit dependency. So sometimes you realize that there are certain order in which the service needs to be restarted, which is not good, right? And usually you can only uh, you know, uh, uh, get that, uh, find that information when you do activities like, a uh, huge activities like upgrades, right? There are also other tons of operational activities that you can piggyback to gain insight about your system, like failover, for example. If you do failover from time to time, you will actually also gain insight about uh, your current system, right? So that's another thing. And lastly, but obviously the most important and also dangerous at the same time is to do the experiment on running system. Uh, this is the grail of chaos engineering. I think if organization can already do it, it will be very, very good. But obviously, uh, it'll take a lot of preparation before we even get here, right? Uh, of, of course, right? Like, I mean, like, uh, if you're talking about chaos engineering, it won't be complete before uh, we speak about the tools, right? So the, the question is, do we actually need tools to do all of the, the things that I mentioned? Uh, so I, I try to recap, like, what kind of help that we can possibly get from a tool, right? So this is our, these four key items are probably uh, four things that I feel pretty important and pretty helpful if we can actually get help from tools. Uh, injecting the faults, gathering the metrics, and scheduling the experiments, and storing all the history to, so that we can revisit it again. So the question is, can tools help us? Right. Fortunately, I think in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation community, uh, we have several tools already. I think today I'm going to highlight two tools that we've been experimenting so far. Uh, I think the first one is Chaos Mesh. Uh, it consisted of several components uh, it has a dashboard that we can use to, uh, you know, take a look and run the experiments. It has the controller manager to orchestrate the experiments, and also has a daemon which is installed as a daemon set in each of the Kubernetes nodes, right? And based on our evaluation, uh, it should actually fulfill the requirements that I posted earlier, right? It can help us injecting various faults. It can help us gather various metrics because it exposes metrics in the slash metrics endpoint, which can, Prometheus can actually collect. And there's also the scheduler, uh, they, they call it the cache workflow. And we, like, obviously, because it's a tool that stores all of your experiments, it can, uh, its result can actually be revisited, uh, yeah, uh, easily. It's, sorry, typo, <laughs> not early. 
uh, there's also another tool that we can utilize in the, this space. Uh, it's called the Litmus Chaos. Uh, it's also very interesting tools. It has a slightly more, a bit more complex uh, architecture, but essentially it's the same. It has the UI that you can interact with. It has the engine, and it also has the runner, which can actually help you uh, run the experiment in, 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 the, in the Kubernetes nodes, right? Uh, maybe one thing that I want to highlight from these tools uh, is that they have this hub, uh, which is the hub.litmuschaos.io. It actually contains uh, experiments that you can reuse from, and it's also built by the community. So if uh, people want to contribute to this uh, you know, hub.litmuschaos.io, you can, you can actually do so. So and it, it can actually enrich the possible experiments that uh, you can use uh, in, in this platform, right? So this is actually pretty cool and pretty helpful for uh, our chaos engineering journey, right? So I think uh, we can go into the next one. Yeah, Iqbal, maybe you wanna uh, share some key takeaways. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, am I audible? Yep. Yeah. All right, uh, so uh, as a wrap up uh, of our engineering, uh, chaos engineering journey, so far we have learned that Actually, uh, software, uh, chaos engineering is a way for us to maintain reliability in, in a complex system sustainably. This is what we learn. And then, of course, uh, how do we do that? By doing continuous verification to our system. And what we learn also is that if you are working in a highly regulated industry in which reliability metrics cannot be bargained, then having uh, adopting SLI, SLO organization organization-wide is a prerequisite uh, to do this. Next, also, uh, it is more than just the tooling, like, you know, the tooling that to break things in production. Uh, it's the whole process. And uh, Gio told, told you earlier about how we go around and interview people to get understanding of their system, how we go around about uh, ensure that all the verifications that we do actually feedback uh, to the system uh, to, to the organization by ensuring uh, proper documentation and but also of course tooling help you uh, tooling help us to uh, make our experiments uh, can be uh, done more systematically uh, ultimately uh, as an organization what we want to do is we want to ensure that we improve our institutional knowledge about uh, the capability of our complex system and improve its reliability uh, so uh, right now, uh, while we have uh, tried uh, with several toolings, like you have mentioned earlier, unfortunately, like the majority of uh, verification system that we do is still run manually. So we would like, like going forward, we want we would like it to be done in more autonomous manner, in continuous manner. Uh, of course, uh, we also want to kind of share uh, and learn from the community about you know of course obviously we are not perfect <laughs> we uh, what we have done is uh, like far from from kind of the holy grail of uh, chaos engineering uh, we are here to kind of share what we've learned and hopefully we can learn from you uh, as a community as well uh, yeah this is some uh, reference that we use uh, throughout our uh, making this presentation. And of course, special thanks to our team. Uh, this is our team, but not everyone is here. Like uh, the entire team of GoPay infrastructure engineering team is 30 people. I don't know if it's big or not big for you, but it's 30 people. <laughs> uh, of course, our head of payment, the bald guy in the middle. Like, uh, But don't worry, I, uh, he's not mad whenever I call him baldy. <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway. Uh, of course, also uh, our uh, fellow engineers in product teams in uh, GoPay, uh, entire GoPay organization. Yeah, I think that's all. Uh, so this is the second non-swearing words <laughs> in Spanish that we know. Gracias. <laughs>